Welcome to another She Clicks webinar. Today, I'm delighted to be hearing from Ruth Grinrod, who's going to tell us about um, processing images. Hi, Ruth. How are you? Hi, I'm okay, apart from the wonders of technology that always <laughs> fail when you yeah. want them to work. Never mind. We had a few technical issues, everyone, but uh, we're there now and everyone can see Ruth's uh, screen. I am going to try and share this on Facebook, but um, we shall see. Who knows? Who knows? Who so knows? at the end, obviously, I will be able to see if anyone's raised their hands. You should see an icon that lets you, allows you to raise your hand to ask a question. And then I'm sure Ruth will do her best to address it. Anyway, Ruth, over to you. I will try and share to Facebook. OK, thank you. Well, um, welcome, everybody, uh, this evening. Um, what I'm going to do tonight is just basically talk you through some processing techniques that I use. Um, I really do want to emphasize that I'm not um, putting myself out here as the expert or an expert. There are many, many ways of processing and, and I'm just sharing some of mine. Um, I'll be using Camera Raw and I'll be using a bit of Photoshop. But basically how I've structured this evening is so that any ability, well, I hope any ability, um, can gain something from it. So if you're a complete beginner, or even if you're an expert, there might be something that you might learn. And uh, for those of you that really um, have no more to learn, then I do apologize now. I'm, I'm just gonna start now with um, a couple of slides. Um, and the first slide, um, you can see, this is just one of my pictures. And you can see the, the text basically says, processing for a reason, what do you want to achieve? Now, I've answered my own question here. Um, my own question here is, I'm processing to print. Um, of course, I post things on Facebook, and of course, I post things on social media. But really, at the end of the day, I want to achieve a print, a print that is worthy of the photograph that I have basically taken. Um, and sometimes that's easier to achieve than others. And sometimes that you will find that something works very, very well for you. And what you really need to do when that works very, very well for you is you need to basically step back and work out why that was. And hopefully during this evening, um, I'll be able to perhaps highlight some of the reasons it does work for you. Um, moving on to me, basically, and my view, I use Camera Raw and Photoshop CC. Now, I don't use Lightroom, not because I am anti-Lightroom or because I don't like Lightroom. Um, it's just because I organise my files differently to how Lightroom organises files. I just have a relatively simple set of folders in Bridge that names the place, the year, and has uh, subfolders of raw, processed, and print. Now, if, of course, I was working at the sharp end of wedding photography and had hundreds of photos, then I'm sure Lightroom would do a wonderful job for me. But basically, the camera raw engine and the Lightroom engine are basically the same. Um, I just prefer camera raw. Now, I am a landscape photographer exclusively, so I don't shoot, shoot portraits or still life. I'm landscapes, sea, seascapes, and some urban work. Um, and I use a Nikon 810, and I use um, a Fuji X-T3. Why do I have two sets of cameras? Well, firstly, uh, the big old heavy Nikon with those heavy lenses that you all know, are uh, it's a camera that's a real workhorse and when you're in places like Harris and the depths of Scotland, Northumberland with roaring winds and big seas, that Nikon has never basically let me down. 
And when I then shoot somewhere that is, say, more urban, I tend to use the Fuji because, to be perfectly honest, I think the Fuji performs fantastically in low lighting situations. And the other reason I use the Fuji is, you know, I'm one of those middle-aged women that are getting older and carrying heavy kit sometimes is just a bit too much. So the Fuji bag gets picked up rather than the Nikon. I don't do composites and I don't use presets. Now, that all sounds a little worthy, doesn't it? It's not meant to sound worthy. It's just for me, I'm not a compositor. If you want to do wonderful composites with your photos, then absolutely excellent. You know, I'm really interested in what people can do, but it's something that I don't do. And the reason I don't use the thousands that are, of presets that are now out there is because I find for me, each landscape picture requires a different style and approach. Um, so for instance, if I'm processing uh, a roaring sea in the depths of winter and then soft bluebells in my local woods, I find that the approach when processing is going to be entirely different, apart from some of the basics, which we'll talk about tonight. If you like presets, if you like buying brushes and all sorts of other things, then that's absolutely fine. As I say, I'm not a purist, I'm not a worthy, good person that only does it one way to make my life harder, it's just the way that I've established. What really my aim is tonight is to show some of my workflow um, and by all means it is not all of my workflow because we only have a limited time and uh, I know from all my years in education you'll be bored within 30 minutes and will switch off as people always do. It doesn't matter how good you are, people lose interest. So I'm showing some of the workflow and some of the thinking uh, which I hope you benefit from in some way. I'm not a Photoshop, Photoshop expert, so what I mean by that is, you know, I couldn't possibly tell you what such a huge program does, and it is a massive graphic design program. I use part of it. But here's the first learning point, if you like, for this evening. The bit to do with layers in Photoshop, and particularly using curves in Photoshop, is really important and if I were to advise any of you tonight of one thing to learn after you've used RAW or Lightroom it is to learn curves within layers um, so much can be achieved it's a very very powerful tool. Now my final, final bullet on here is picture or photo now what do I what do I mean by that picture or photo now, do I want to always compose a photo that is a postcard image? What do I mean by that? Uh, it sounds derogatory, it's not meant to be derogatory, but a postcard image is basically sometimes replicating the landscape that you're in, um, you know, almost to the nth degree. And sometimes I want to do that if it is such a perfect landscape. And sometimes I want to do that if I want to emphasize the beauty of that landscape or the ruggedness of that landscape. But inevitably, I find that there's an emotional element to all aspects of landscape photography. And so therefore, what I'm aiming to do by the end of the processing techniques that I use is to create a picture which is from a photograph, but that picture is a photograph that I and others will hopefully want to look at again and again, not on a six inch phone screen or on your iPad or wherever else you're looking at small digital images, but in print form. So that's basically where I'm coming from at that sort of, at this sort of point. Okay, now here's a picture now, I, of course, tonight I'm working um, with two screens here. I've got a calibrated uh, ISO screen that I process on, which 
basically replicates my colours when I print perfectly. And I've also got an old uh, Apple Mac cinema screen here where um, the colours have been rendered pretty saturated uh, in these photos. And by the time it gets to you, and by the time you've looked at it, I'm sure the colours um, will change again. So that's unfortunate, uh, but it's what's what we work with and that's what we have to deal with tonight. But this picture here is of um, some woods in Cumbria. And I'm using the word picture because of course it's a landscape photograph. And uh, of course it's showing autumn, but hopefully within the processing that I've kept deliberately soft um, by using particular sliders, e.g. the clarity slider, uh, and also using the contrast slider, I've created, I hope, a soft, dreamy image of autumn. Uh, the next one is, of course, of a bright, sunny image, another picture that I would want to hang on my wall that depicts the beauty of spring, the blue of bluebells, the green of the growth, and even a little bit of mist in the distance there. Uh, these are just a few of the photos. Um, here's a very different one again. Uh, this is of a beach in Donegal, much, much more a replication of the landscape. But again, the beach in Donegal is uh, quite an amazing beach and I felt needed that replication. So therefore for me, I was concentrating on capturing that image with um, hoping that I would inspire people's interest to look at it, you know, from uh, the tidal stream that's, that's running towards the sea, out to the rocks, and then out towards those incredible sand dunes um, that are in the background. Um, and the last one I've put in here, and I'll explain a bit, is um, a picture of uh, Nairn Beach. And right in the corner on the right hand side, there's a tiny, tiny family, um, because it was taken at some distance playing in the sand. Now, you will notice, I hope in this photo, that you will see there's a bit of intentional camera movement in it, uh, and some very soft processing to catch this almost retro style of Nairn Beach in the summer, one of my favourite beaches in the northeast of Scotland that I spend a lot of time at. And I talk about intentional camera movement because I know it is very fashionable and I know people use it a lot and some people use it extremely well. Um, I use it sometimes, I don't use it for all of my images, but the reason I have shown this one and the others, which are all completely different, and here's the first contentious point of the evening, and by all means disagree with me if you want to, um, that I don't like the idea that all my pictures have to have a very, very similar style. I like the idea for me that the landscape is an ever-changing landscape and therefore it requires a difference when you come to shoot it, you have to think about it in different ways and when you come to process it. I know there are people that have got very, very particular styles, but I think Angela described my style as diverse and I think Angela is spot on with that and I don't really care whether it's fashionable or not, that's the style that I prefer. Okay, um, don't worry, I'm not going to bore you with these slides all night. I am going to go on to show a little bit of processing and what I do. And there may be uh, a break while I switch screens. Um, so, you know, please talk amongst yourselves while we do that at the end of the slides. And I do apologise, but that's trying to use two screens and uh, doing technology um, um, that has its limitations. Okay, this is what I begin by doing. I begin by evaluating each shot that I take, every single shot that I look at. And I discard all of the duds, every one of them. What do I mean by dud? I mean the ones that have got camera shake on. I'm a landscape photographer, nine times out of ten, I'm using a tripod. If I'm using a tripod on sand and I haven't got it basically embedded or dug in or there's a great big wave, camera shake happens very easily, as does it with wind and, 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 and. 
I do take some handheld images um, with with my camera, but I have to say most of the stuff is still done um, using a tripod. And can I say that those of you that are landscape photographers, please, please invest in the best tripod you can possibly afford, uh, because putting a camera on three sweet pea canes and it falling over in bad weather, that's the end of your photography. And basically you have lost the money as well. So I discard the duds, but I do not delete all immediately. Biggest mistake you can make is to look on the back of the camera and go, no, 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 no. Because actually you can only tell so much from the back of the camera. And the back of the camera is also very, very good at making your uh, photos look fantastic because that's basically the job of camera companies. They want you to look on the back of the camera and think that you have taken the best photograph that anybody's ever taken. So what I do is I keep all of my files, unless they're rubbish, the duds as I talked about, and then I look back over time and I reevaluate. Now what always happens is that you find a photo that's really good, that you really like, and you start work on it. So you must plan your edit. The, the, you, the, the, what happens is usually people are very excited, they look at the photos, you know, they get them back home, they look at them on a screen, sometimes they look at them on a small screen, which isn't the best way to view your photos, and they dive in, and that's what I did. That's what I did years ago. I dived in and I whacked this slider this side and pulled down tones and did all sorts of things. But now I look at an image and I think, okay, I've got a plan. What do I want to achieve here? And basically the first thing that I think you have to do is I think you have to make sure that you are looking at all of the tones in the image and seeking to balance them. What do you want to achieve? What does the end product look like? What are you envisaging in your brain? Now I've put a raw photo on this slide tonight and um, that's taken in Northumberland at about four o'clock in the morning in the summer uh, and it was particularly clear dawn as you can see and I've put the histogram to the left and the reason I've put the histogram to the left is that the histogram is showing you what tones are in this raw photograph. The histogram is, if you like, your bit of data that tells you what is here. And it's pretty clear that the first tones that we see, the prominence in this, are dark tones. They're on the left-hand side, they're in the shadows, they're not in the blacks, they haven't clipped the blacks, otherwise the clipping triangle would be on. And we have less tones in the whites and the highlights. So that's giving me some idea of where to start. That is really important for all of you thinking of processing, that you really need to know that the histogram is the first thing that you really need to look about. It represents the tones from naught, which is on the left hand side, that's the blacks, up to 256, which is absolute white. And if, for instance, you do have clipped tones that are white in your picture, if you go to print those tones, which is 256, it's absolute white, they won't print. No ink will be la laid down on your paper. So then again, that's another point that's really worth knowing. All the tones in between are basically greys of some sort or another. I hope that's making sense. Here's another couple of photos, couple of raw photos. Uh, and if you look at the trees, which are some local woods, um, lovely shades of green, but it's interesting, isn't it, that you can see here there's a triangle in the left hand corner that shows a little bit of black clipping. And if you look at that histogram and you look at the photo, you can work out that that clipping is probably coming from the lower part of that trunk. That's where the darkest areas are. There's some also dark black branches to the left hand side. It's probably coming from there. 
that's not difficult to recover. However, if the right hand clipping triangle was clipped and the white part of the graph was way up on the right hand side, you may have difficulty recovering those highlights or whites, should I say, sorry. We're now looking at uh, four pieces of grass. I don't know why I put, the oh yes, I did four pieces of grass uh, in the snow. Uh, and I put this on deliberately, deliberately sorry about that, um, because as you can, when you look at that histogram, the histogram is way off to the right. It is not clipped, but it is way off to the white, right. And this is basically called a narrow histogram. So to work with this, you're, you're working with very, very limited tones. Why is the histogram to the right? Well, we're taking snow. Um, for those of you that like to take snow, snow confuses sensors in the camera. Um, and so therefore you always have to slightly in your camera expose to the right further than you would to make sure that the whites are white and that you don't get home and go, all oh, my snow pictures are grey. I hope that's making sense. Okay, um, here is um, basically a description of the histogram. And if you look at the top left hand histogram, you can see where the whites, the highlights, the mid-tones, the shadows and the blacks are. And I've put on the right hand side an example of a histogram that shows where the shadows and the blacks are clipped. And the histogram underneath that is showing white clipping. And if you have those levels of clipping, it's much easier to sort out the blacks than it is the white. So you really need to look at that histogram on the back of your camera or use the blinkies or whatever it is that you wish to use to try and get a decent histogram. Um, I've put a little bit of theory on there. That's basically for you uh, that you might want to come back and look at this another time. I'm going to skip it. But the bit here that I've put on is, is it possible to achieve as a landscape photographer the perfect histogram? You see, I think it is possible to achieve it if you are setting up studio work. Um, but actually in the landscape, um, we've got things to deal with that are very difficult, like bright lights of the sun uh, that shine through from time to time, uh, or you suddenly find that you're in very, very dull overcast lighting um, that isn't going to change. The perfect histogram is very hard to achieve, but it's something that you just want to be aware of. Um, and you certainly need to avoid that highlight clipping and if you can, the shadow clipping. Um, this is another piece of information that I've put on for people for when they want to basically come back and look at this video, if they want to, by all means don't. Um, but the bits I've put on here are just the definitions of what contrast is, uh, what vibrance is, what saturation is. I've not put them all on, I've put some of them on so that you can come back and look at that. And one of the things I use a lot of, and people will go, oh, she uses clarity. But the reason I've put clarity on here for you tonight to look at is basically what clarity is doing is it is enhancing the mid-tone contrast. And that is absolutely vital to know because if you're going to use clarity well, you need to know it enhances the mid-tones. It can make a tremendous difference to the images that you're processing. Okay, so this is my basic workflow and then we will get onto some images. Get it right on camera first. E.g. is it sharp? Look at the histogram. Can you get it right in camera every time? No, you can't. Uh, you, you have to work at it and you have to adapt. I use filters, um, so therefore I balance the dynamic range, which helps get it right. People that say that you can do everything in camera raw or Photoshop, I disagree with. I still think you need to use good quality, high tech format, um, Lee and there are plenty of other very good filters that you can use. I use them nearly all the time. 
when you get home, you need to look at what you have got on screen. You need to go back to the sharpness and you need to go back to the histogram. You need to discard all of the soft images, every single one of them. You will not make it look good unless you are going to do things with composites and layers and if you like make that sort of image um, that is basically a picture made up of many shades and colours and textures. Work in a 16-bit file in Camera Raw, which I shall show you, um, because 16-bit files have greater depth, e.g. they have more information, e.g. they have more colours, e.g. you have more colour and depth in the tones. Plan your edit. And now, what do I mean by that? Plan your edit. Well, you know, look at your photo and go, well, what was it like when I was there? What emotive element do I want to achieve within this photo? Uh, what can I do to make it stand out from other photos I've taken? Uh, is it going to be a photo that reflects drama or is it going to be a photo that reflects tranquility? How are you going to get there? You have to have some idea how to get there. Sliding the sliders about mm, with no real reason is quite a nice thing to do to get to know how the sliders work, but it doesn't mean that you'll achieve a great photo. Um, get to know those sliders. They all have a purpose and you can come back to that slide that I put on earlier and use them to bring out the tones, the tones of the photo. That doesn't mean the color necessarily, it means all of the tones up where are, that are within them. Okay, is there a balance in the tonal range? Is there a balance between the upper portion of the photo and the lower portion of the photo? So I see often in black and white photos, and again, this has become quite fashionable, that we have very, very black skies. Well, there's no tones, is there? There's just a black sky. And then underneath, we might have a pale rock. And then underneath that, we might have some more black sand. That's in the black and white photo, obviously. I don't think as far as I can remember that that really was the intention of a black and white photo. I think a black and white photo is meant to show a range of tones from basically white through to black with a set of greys in between. So that also applies to colour photos as well. Have we got a very overdramatic sky? We've all seen those things in Facebook that have got, you know, dramatic skies and then underneath it's a set of whatever and it doesn't really match the top part of the picture. Is your horizon straight? Is there barrel distortion? Are there colour casks? Have you got chromatic aberration? Are there dust and sensor spots? All of those things need looking at. Um, okay, now these are two photos I hope you can see. On the left is the raw, look at the, the um, um, histogram. Um, and you can see that that histogram is pretty much in the middle, in the middle of uh, the histogram range. You can see there's a lot of greys. And it's not rocket science, is it? But if you look at the raw photo, okay, there are a lots of greys within that photo. This was taken earlier before this appalling crisis in uh, Melanie Drugal in Scotland in February. Now, I really like this photo. Um, there are faults with the photo uh, in the sense that I can see that that rock on the left hand side is extremely irritating. And you're all saying she takes the rock out. Yes, I do take the rock out because that's the first thing that my eye sees on there. It sees that set of that little tiny rock on the left hand side and it's particularly irritating and then if I go over to the horizon again there's a little dark rock uh, with the mountains behind and then there's another irritating little bit of rock on the right there. Um, so why did I take that photo with those bits of rock in it? Well I took it because I wanted these tidal patterns. So therefore the trade-off is, well, I can't move the rocks, I can't swim and move the rocks out of the way. Um, so therefore what I had to do is remove those very tiny things. I don't remove great big things, but I remove things that distract the eye and that's what that is doing. 
So that was the raw image with that histogram. And then we come over to the final image, final. And I use final, or is it? Because the other thing that I do is I save in PSDs or TIFFs. Uh, storage is cheap. You can save huge, great files these days. And if I want to come back and alter or change or look at something again, in fact, I've just looked at something at the bottom of that final image there, and I think, oh, yeah, I could have just taken out those couple of dots on the left-hand side there, which were perhaps just a little bit of stone that's irritating. You can come back and you can come, you can come and alter it. The reason I'm showing these two things before I go into the next bit, which is actually the processing, is that there, there are similarities. Of course there are similarities between the raw and the final, but the raw is the flat, unprocessed. So this nonsense about, I don't do anything, I just allow it to, to come out of the camera as it is, well, it's nonsense. Because it's nonsense because it's an unprocessed photo. That's a bit like Ansel Adams saying, because, you know, when I've got that negative under the enlarger, I don't do any work on it, I just print it as it is. You know, they dodged, they burned, they brought out different tones, and that's basically what we are doing using digital software. And when you look at the final image, you can see that the purpose of this photograph, as I saw it, was to show the absolute beauty of the aquas and the blues and the greys, but to really emphasise the tidal patterns, uh, the darks and the greys within it, but not to such an extent that they overpower the whole image. So if you look at the tones in the sky, and you look at the tones in the sand, they are basically balanced up. And again, using um, a filter, a neutral density filter, I'd slowed down the water sufficiently to get those nice tidal wavel patterns just uh, breaching the sum of those sands there. Um, and this photo here, okay, the roar is on the left-hand side and the right hand side is the finished image. It is not so different, but you can see that the tones have been brought out, uh, the movement in the sea has been brought out, but there is a complete tonal balance. I mean, this was the photo this year that I won um, Scottish Nature Photography Awards Photographer of the Year with this. And, you know, when they announced it, I was really shocked. But, you know, when I now look back, because they look at the raw and they look at the image, I could see that the image basically portrayed what it was meant to be portraying, which is the butt of Lewis um, and that stormy, rainy day back in October with big seas. Okay, I'm going on to the next, last slide now, which basically say that says a picture is made. Okay, right. Okay, now I'm, I'm going to start with this image in um, raw. And just to recap a couple of things that I said. Can you see my um, um, mouse? Can everybody see my mouse? Uh, at the bottom of the screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I haven't got one of those fancy pointers that people have, but, you know, please shout, Angela, if there are things that I'm saying that are not clear and I'll just go back over it, okay? No problem. Okay. Now, at the bottom of the screen here, I talked about working in 16-bit. And here you can see I'm working in Profoto RGB. I used to work in Adobe RGB. I'm now working Profoto RGB um, because my understanding of color space is that this has the maximum colors within it, but I am certainly not an expert and there are far better people to ask than me. But if you work in Adobe RGB or Profoto RGB, uh, that's great. Then it says 16-bit. And then it says quite clearly what the size of the photo is. This is a Nikon file. And then it basically says I'm also working at 300 ppi. So how you get to that is you just click on and off. When the photo comes in to RAW, you click on that and you make sure you get that to 16 bit. Okay. Now, this photo is taken in Torridon. It's Loch Clare. It is one of the iconic spots. I don't know how many photos 
have been taken over the decades of Loch Clare, millions, and there will be millions more, and for very good reasons, it is an iconic spot. Um, you will then see, and I'm moving up to the histogram here, that this histogram of this photo really is a pretty good histogram. And if I can just show, there's no clipping, so there's no white clipping and there's no black clipping. Um, it's got a range of tones within it. We can see that. And when we go over a histogram, you can see there are the whites, there are the highlights. That shows the exposure within the, the center section. There are the shadows and there are the blacks at the end, okay? And you can see that there's a whole range of tones within it. Now I'm gonna move back a bit, Angela. Can you, is that okay? And can you see yep. the tools down the side, Angela? Has everybody got the tools? On the right hand side, yes. Yeah. Can you see, can you see my tools where my mouse is? Yes. Okay, perfect. Right, so we've got this histogram. Now, it's a beautiful early morning, February, perfect dawn shot. Um, I've got it in Adobe Color, um, just to show people that you could switch to Adobe Landscape, and I think that is quite ghastly, to be perfectly honest, in the sense of the saturation of the pinks. Uh, and if I move to Adobe Vivid, um, that's actually less. Uh, uh, saturated, but I'm going to put it back to Adobe Color. I've got um, a temperature here of 6,400. Now, that basically is wrong for me because um, it was taken early morning and I set uh, the temperature on the Kelvin scale and I set it usually to about 5,000 for an early morning shot. So why is it saying 6,400? It's saying 6,400 because I was rushing to get this shot and hadn't changed it from the night before. So there we are. That's the never go rushing for shots or leave things to the last minute. So I'm just going to edge that temperature down just a bit so that we get that slight change in the blues and if I go to the bottom of the screen I can toggle between what we had which was that sort of pinkiness to a now softer pink with softer blues in so I've just brought them down if I brought it down a lot more it would be much bluer um, but I'm going to keep it at about 5.5. Five. Exposure wise I'm just going to nudge it up a little tiny bit and the reason I'm nudging it up a tiny bit is I just want to bring out over on this side here where the beautiful beautiful Scots pines are that are absolutely gorgeous if you've never seen them just bring up those tones slightly there um, you can see that we're still not clipping anything in this histogram at the top there I'm not going to touch highlights at this point in time, and I'm not going to touch shadows at this point in time, but I will come back to those. But I am going to just hold down Alt on my court keyboard. I'm using a Mac, um, and I don't know what the equivalent is. Um, I'm sure Angela does, but I don't. Um, and I'm just going to see where my whites are. And what you basically do is you hold down Alt and you move the whites over until you see a little bit of clipping. Can you see? Now, if I go like that, you can see loads of colors coming in. That's, you know, that's not how to do it. So I'm going to go back to where we were, double click on the little arrow on the slider and it brings you back to the beginning. And I'm gonna go carefully, so just to make sure that my whites are in on this photo. And the moment it cut it, there's the red just showing. So that's brightened the whites in this particular photo. So the whites are in, which basically means when I talk about the whites being in, that when you go to print your photo, the whites, will be as they should be. And now I'm gonna look at the blacks. And I'm going to, again, hold the Alt key down and go 
to the left this time. And you can see on the left hand side of the screen, I hope I'll make it very obvious. It shouldn't obviously be like that, but if I come back, we can just see the blacks are just in as well. But what that has done, as you can see, is that that has taken down uh, the trees again. But the blacks are as they should be for a print. So what I'm going to do again, looking at that histogram, is I'm just going to nudge up a little bit more on the exposure. Lots of people do not use the exposure button. They somehow have been taught things like, gosh, I must never use it, the exposure slider here. Um, well, exposure is basically this part. So if I'm nudging it slightly, and it is slightly, just to bring out a few more of the tones. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at uh, the clarity button. Now, uh, for those of you that were listening, uh, and I don't blame you if you weren't, but if you were listening, you will understand that the clarity button basically brings up uh, the midtones or brings down the midtones or basically emphasizes the midtones. So I'm going to move the clarity just to plus 13. So let's just look again by toggling on and off where we are by these tiny movements, tiny movements that we have done so far. So we were there, which is really quite a dark quite a flat scene, actually got a bit of a yellowy tint to it. We toggle it back on and we have got that early morning pale blue, pale pinks coming through with the gorgeousness of um, the reeds, which are a combination of greens and oranges. And we've got the clarity at 13. For me, I don't think this camera, a bit, sorry, this picture needs any more vibrance. I don't think it needs any more saturation at this particular point. Just to show you what vibrance does though, if I were to use vibrance, it is basically emphasizing saturation and contrast. And if I push it right to the right, it's revolting, an absolute revolting mess. If I push it down here, well, it's taken all the colour out. I don't think, double click on that little icon on the slide that brings it back to nothing. I feel it doesn't need any vibrance. If I was to move the saturation, we just have horrid, horrid, horrid colours. The funny thing about um, Scotland is, is that if people that have never actually been and never seen it, sometimes they say those colours are not as they should be, you know, they're far too bright um, and, you know, they're far too saturated. But I can assure you this is one of those scenes that, you know, the colours can be like that, particularly in parts of Perthshire so, in autumn. So that's what we've done so far. We were there, we're now here. So already what we've done is we've brought out some of the tones, but we've still got some areas to work on and we're still in raw. Okay, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to bring up the shadows. Now, I know what's going to happen, but I'm going to bring them up anyway. So I bring up the shadows and those trees come up beautifully. But unfortunately, everything else comes up at the same time as well, doesn't it? So I'm going to double click back and leave the shadows there. And I'm going to go to an adjustment brush which on the keyboard is K. Click on that adjustment brush. I'm going to go over to this little tiny set of four lines here, and I'm going to click on there, and I'm going to go reset local cor corrections. And all these sliders have been reset to nothing. So if, for instance, I hadn't have reset local corrections, I'd have taken my brush, and here is my brush here, and I'd have painted on here and the exposure, if it had been pulled way down, would have exposed the sky in a very particular way. So here is my brush size. I can make it big, 
I can make it smaller. I'm going to take a, a relatively small brush and I've got a large feather of 55 around it and I'm going to up my flow to about 69 completely and the density is 100. Down here you can see I've got something called a mask and it's going to put a colour overlay over, the, over this particular picture that I paint over. So I'll just give you a very quick example. If I click mask there and I go like that, you can see that that is bright purple. You can make that mask any colour you like, but for me, purple is the one that stands out. And I'm going to click off that mask. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take my brush down a, a bit smaller, because I'm doing this for you tonight on this particular size screen and I'm only at 23% on the screen because here is where I would make it much larger. I would be doing this at 100%. I've now put it to 25 and I'm gonna take my mask, click my mask, take my brush, uh, take that off, uh, and I'm going to paint over this bit here. Oh, hang on, I've got to reset that. Okay, mask and take that off and delete that. So I've just, I'm now going to do that again. I'm going to paint over this here, these trees here. Now this is done very, very roughly. Um, you can use the bracket keys to basically enlarge or take down the size of the brush, the bracket keys on the keyboard. And the erase button just shows you, I, I don't want it on these particular bits. Now, please bear in mind that this would be done a lot more carefully than I am doing it tonight for you. I'm doing a presentation, so therefore I've got to work at speed, otherwise you really would be bored or witless. I'm now going to take the mask off. So you're saying to me, well, what's she done that for? Why is she taking the mask off? Because now I can use any of these sliders, any of them, because I've painted over this part of the photograph, I've masked it. I've not touched any other part of the photograph. I can now, if I want to, do that. And of course I don't want to do that. Harsh lines where I've shown the exposure. Double click, come back. I can take away all the contrast from there if I wanted to. I can experiment if I want to with those particular sliders. And what in fact I'm going to do, and hopefully you want to guess this, I'm going to take my shadows up. Now you have to be careful when you use sliders uh, or you do local adjustments because there is a reason of course that those trees were in more darkness than the rest of this mountain and that's because the sun uh, comes up from behind you and it hits this mountain first and then it takes its time to move round. But I've just upped those shadows just by plus 34, and you can see that there are some more uh, 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 light shining on them. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna add a little bit more clarity to make them stand out that bit more. And I'm going to then push those shadows slightly more that I've got that clarity on them. And the reason that I've used clarity and shadows is the clarity has enhanced the mid-tones and the shadows has brought out the low parts of the exposure, but I've kept the sort of nice, neat sharpness of them. Is that clear? Yeah? Okay, next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at uh, these reeds. Now it's really easy to do this with an adjustment brush. Um, you go painting away and then suddenly you realise that you haven't clicked here for a new brush and you haven't clicked here, reset local correction. Here, these reeds were very sharp um, in the sense that they were gilded with pieces of frost. And so what I'm going to do here is again, I'm going to take a, a, a relatively small brush, 
and I'm going to go over the reeds. Again, this would be done much more carefully and over here uh, and over here. And now what I need to do is I need to get that erase button and just take it away from the water, take it away from the bits uh, that I don't want it. Uh, some dark bits down here. Again, done in quite a rush, but I hope you get what I'm talking about. We don't want it up over on those there. Unclick the mask. And then I'm just basically going to increase the highlights slightly. So they just come up slightly and I'm going to also increase the whites there slightly. Again, looking at the histogram, nothing's clipping. Just tip up the exposure just a bit. You probably saw that come up down here. And now I'm going to add the clarity. So these reads have a much more 3D look. And by doing that, I need to also increase the shadows. So what we now have is we have these lovely, crisp, frosty reeds and grasses that have a bit of a 3D look. We've taken up the shadows from here and we've still got a lovely histogram up here. I haven't used any of these fancy uh, graduated filters and radio filters, which of course you can, that's absolutely fine. What I don't do, and most people do do, is they use this brush for spot removal. And uh, I'm gonna get back to that in a minute and say why I haven't done that. What I'm now going to do is I'm going to go back to the main menu, and I'm gonna look again by holding down the Alt and clipping on my blacks, and my blacks are still there. They're still in, they're still on the left hand side. You can just see them poking through. Uh, even though I've added the clarity, I added the clarity, but I upped the shadows and the exposure, which meant I wasn't taking down the blacks. So now I'm gonna look at the whites and I can see a little, little few peakies down there, which to be perfectly honest on, I can tell you now they would not show within a print. But for the purists amongst us, I will just not knock those down a bit um, with the exposure button. Oh no, no, I'll show you another way. Uh, I've got them up again there, let's say. If you look at the tone curve down there, there are the blacks right down there. And if I just nudge that up just a very tiny bit, when we come back to here and we look at the blacks, they'll be gone which they are, there are no blacks showing whatsoever. Next thing I do is I go to chromatic aberration and I'll say remove chromatic aberration, even though you can't see any on these mountains, but I can absolutely assure you that that is there. I will then go to sharpening and I'll do some basic sharpening. I'm gonna leave that at um, 26 radius of 0 0.8, 0 0.8, the radius basically picks out the finest detail. I'm going to leave the detail at 25 and I want to mask that sky and it is here that we will see if there are any sensor spots and there are one there. Now you can do that with the brush if you want to in um, Camera Raw, but I tend to do it in Photoshop only because I think it works better. So that is what we did with the picture from here we sorry uh, that says done right, we're now back uh, and now we're into photoshop and you will know that i have got all sorts of things uh, on the screen oh, hardly anything on the screen here at the moment this is the picture now opened in photoshop and uh, I'm just going to open uh, some of the other um, actions are there. Uh, I want my history panel there. Okay. And uh, I've got my history open and I want my layers open as well over here. Now I have mine floating, which is why I'm having to get them up tonight because um, I've got two screens and so that I put them onto another screen. So we're in Photoshop now and um, I've, I've taken it in just as it was um, by clicking on the right click. We're in Photoshop. 
And what I want to look at now is what do I basically need to do in Photoshop? You know, do, do, do I uh, like the picture as it is? I always work on a light gray background uh, or a white background uh, because if you look at the gray background and the white background, uh, you often get a better idea of what that's going to look like as a print. Now I'm just going um, to basically reduce the size of this print on screen. Uh, is that okay, Angela? Can people see that? Yes. Okay. Um, you just going to when, you had the, the, when you were specifically talking about the histogram and it was... Sorry, I didn't hear you. I can't hear you, Angela. You should, can you hear me? Yeah, can you speak a little louder for me? I, the only issue was when you were talking specifically about the histogram and it was in the top right corner. But okay, all right, thanks so much. I'll make this a bit bigger, okay. So here we are. Um, I've got your picture up there, Andrew, so that's, what's, that's why I keep moving the, moving the picture about. We're, in, uh, we're basically there now in Photoshop, as I said. I'm going to press Command-J and I'm going to make a copy of the background. And I've done that because I don't want to work on the original photo. I've done all this work on it. Um, I want to work on a layer and that layer is non-destructive, which means I can do anything I want on this layer, however horrible, good, bad or indifferent, but I've still got my background layer that is intact. So I'm looking at this photo here and I'm thinking to myself, mm, okay, I talked about balancing tones, didn't I? So what I'm going to look at here um, is I'm looking at these tones are quite bright. So I'm going to use a curves layer here and I'm just going to take the photo down so I can show you what I'm basically going to do. I'm going to take my lasso tool and I'm going to basically take my lasso tool and I'm going to uh, draw round here very, very roughly. This would be done much, 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 much more carefully if I was doing it for real. I'm going to come basically up here. Sometimes I come way off the screen. And you can see these marching ants, which basically shows that I have uh, looked at the sky here and I've drawn around it. I'm then going to go to my curves and here you can see the histogram here is showing um, that we are really at the upper end of the histogram so we're really looking at the highlights and I said didn't I that I, I wasn't that happy um, about the tonal balance of the sky and the bottom part of the picture. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull those highlights down very slightly. I'm going to do things like this and here you can see where I've badly drawn that lasso tool because I'm in a rush. But nonetheless I'm just going to drop them down slightly and you can see that there's a greater tonal balance now between the sky, the reeds, and the water and again we've still got detail here in our beautiful trees and we've still got our whites here. I've just dropped them down a bit. Let me drag that peg off, that's where we were and I'm just dropping them very slightly on that histogram. That's all I have done in this particular photo. So if I wanted to, and for the purposes of this video, I'm not going to because you will just be uh, beyond yourselves with boredom. I could work on all little elements of this. I could use dodging and burning to bring out particular elements of um, the uh, reeds and the, the grasses here. But what I wanted to show you with this particular photo is I wanted to show you from a very nice photo as it looked on the back of the camera and a very nice photo as it appeared on the screen. I just brought out the tones of this and done some very basic adjustments and I can tell you that if you were to print that photo once I've sharpened it properly it would look um, 
absolutely as it does on screen because I've got my calibrated screen so I know that the colours are right. Just so you can see the difference, that's what it looks like on a white screen there. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to take it back uh, into Camera Raw. And so I go to Filter and I go to Camera Raw Filter. Sorry, I haven't flattened it, sorry. That took back in that layer. So I'm gonna make a stamp layer of them all. That means I won't lose what I've got. The stamp layer basically puts all of the layers together and puts the background layer back at the top. So I'm going to press um, arrow alt command E and I've got that stamp layer there, which has basically combined all of the layers together. I'm going to go to filter. I'm going to go to camera raw filter and I'm back in camera raw. Now it's done. She said it was done, didn't she? But is it? Is it done? Firstly, I didn't correct that dust spot, so I'm going to do it now. The joys of doing things live, don't know what possessed me. I'm going to correct that there and move that up to there and basically undo visual spots. That's done. Uh, that's okay. And now, but sorry, I've taken it back into there. So filter, sorry about that. Camera raw filter, back into camera raw filter. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to check my blacks again. Are they still in? Yes, they are there. Just move them a little. My whites are, ah, now my whites have changed a bit, haven't they? Because um, I went over here when obviously I was drawn with that lasso. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, nudge those down, those highlights to there, and now the whites and the blacks are in. I'm now gonna to go to here, onto sharpening, and this is for print. And I sharpen at 40, and note I'm doing it in black and white, because black and white is a really good way of sharpening. It sort of emphasizes the details and the tones. I'm gonna make my radius 0.8, I'm going to whack my detail up to 80. This is a Nikon file. And I'm going to mask that particular picture. And I hope what you have seen from this particular picture um, is that we used some very basis, basic processing. And then we did some very basic processing also in Photoshop to achieve what I hope you would agree with me is a perfectly tonally balanced picture um, of a very beautiful scene. Okay, right. Now, this is a completely different image. It's a long exposure. As you can see, oh, right, I'll move that histogram across. Can you see the histogram? Yes. Right. Uh, sorry, it hasn't reached Facebook Live yet. Yes, it's right. visible on, on Facebook Live as well. Okay, are we there now? Yes. Yeah, so histogram. Ah, 122 seconds. Uh, again, on a nick and bar, it was a deliberate long exposure taken in Diabeg in Scotland, low ISO, 24 to 70. Uh, okay, I'm looking at this picture. What do I want to achieve? This is a very different picture to I had before, isn't it? What I wanted to achieve in the other one was basically a beautiful spring, uh, February morning with the pinks and the blues and capturing that iconic scene. This is a very moody, long exposure. Now, there are all sorts of problems with this picture. Uh, firstly, this looks like it's on the slant, and it's not, it's actually a curve. So we have to think about what we want to do about that. Um, do, how are we going to make it clear that it's a curve, or how are we going to try and make it clear? Some people do straightening within it. Um, I'm not going to do that uh, this time round. Um, because we haven't got the time. But these boys, you see, I'm not very keen on these boys. I don't particularly like that. Uh, the, the rocks were lovely and dark. And I love this flash of the, the, the life uh, ring here. Um, and we can see that the rocks are basically 
matching. Now I know that I took this in the rain, I know I did. So I'm going to uh, go to spot removal, visualize spots and good Lord, look at all these that I've got to do. Now I find both in Lightroom and here that this works fairly well, but not basically perfectly. So I didn't go over them last time, which I should have done, but I should have looked at them at 100% um, when I uh, was in Photoshop and used the spot removal tool there. So that's basically done there. So we've done that. Okay. Looking at the histogram, uh, well, we've got basically nothing on this side here whatsoever. Um, so hardly any whites and because basically it's a very gray scene, even though it's a color photograph. So again, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to up the exposure and that makes a very white sky, but again, we're not clipping, but it, it just brings up a few of the tones in those rocks. So if we come back, we can see they are much darker. So I'm going to up that to the 25 again there. Um, there's not going to be uh, any real use of the contrast slider here. That's just going to make things blacker and blacker. There are faults here. Can you see this vignetting up here and down here? I'm going to have to look at that. But we'll do that in a moment. Don't concentrate on the faults, concentrate on what you want to achieve. I like very much the greys here. There's absolutely no question about that. Uh, this is a little bit too bright. So we're gonna have to think about that. And I want to bring out some of the clarity of the rock formations here. And probably I want to emphasize this bit of red. That's what I like. I don't like the boys. I like the line of the rope coming down by the steps, uh, just showing with bits of seaweed on it. And again, one of the things I didn't emphasize is when you're doing this, you do need to zoom in command plus or using the plus side down here to really look at the image in detail. Uh, but if I do that tonight, all you're going to see is tiny little bits of detail that uh, uh, it's not going to be helpful. If I was doing this as one-to-one, -one, that would be fine. So um, what am I going to do? I'm going to look again at my whites. And we can see here that there's no white showing in there. And even if I push them all the way up, they only start to come out there. Now, I'm going to look at this. Well, I don't like that. I look at that and I think, ah, oh, well, you know, I think those whites are a bit too bright. So I'm going to bring them down a bit. There's no question about that. I'm going to bring these whites down. Not too much. That's where they were. They were at 50, hang on, they were at about, about 54, 53. And I'm going to bring them down to about 38. Better tonal balance here. Um, looking at the blacks. Yeah, they're just in. There's no question about that. They're down here on these rocks here. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use again the clarity slider to basically emphasize the clarity of the rocks just a bit at this point in time. Not too much, just a bit. So we started with that. We're now here. Still lots wrong with this picture. There's absolutely no question whatsoever. I'm going to use the tone uh, uh, curve here as well. And I'm just going to go to the mid-tones here. And I'm just going to pull them down slightly. And then just nudge up just a tiny bit on that histogram there. And I'm just going to push up here as well. And come back to here. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a, uh, uh, an adjustment brush like I did before and I'm going to uh, reset local corrections which I nearly forgot with my mask and I'm going to paint over this long exposure sky and as you can see it was a particularly dull day hence the long exposure uh, and 
might know, take the arrays button again and just arrays very quickly around that. Please, when you're doing this, do it a damn sight better than I'm doing it tonight because it makes all the difference. And you remember now, I take off the mask, okay? And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to bring down the exposure slightly. And you can see that vignetting is happening again in these corners, and we're going to look at that. And I'm going to bring down the highlights. And we've got more of a uh, more of a, a tonal balance coming here. We've also brought in a little bit of blue here as well. But again, we can see that because that wasn't masked perfectly, there are a few issues. So next thing I'm going to do is take a new brush, reset local corrections, and I really don't like these dark really don't like these dark corners here even though we've still got to look at them I'm just going to highlight those slightly take that away and I'm just going to just going to nudge the highlights up slightly and the shadows up slightly still got the vignetting but it's slightly different slightly different to what it was okay next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take another new brush reset local corrections and I'm going to uh, paint over basic why is it not painting there I'm going to paint over the rocks here very very roughly here and we'll, then we'll come to there very roughly done for your uh, for you all tonight what I'm going to do there is I'm going to lift the shadows quite considerably and then I'm going to put back some mid-tones with the clarity and that's really emphasizing if you come in here and we look down here we can see that those tones and the formations of those rocks have been emphasized by the clarity. One thing I didn't mention earlier is one way I look at a picture is to look at it like that. What are you looking at it like that for? Well, immediately, you can see all the issues with this picture. It's too dark there. You've got bits of dark here that I don't particularly like. Um, so that's, you, you can automatically see where things have got wrong. So zooming in and zooming out makes a big difference. So this is where we are at the moment. Um, I'm going to take another new brush. I'm going to reset local corrections and I'm going to basically paint over uh, here again very quickly, very quickly indeed, uh, and just take away some of this so I can just sort of make a sort of point to you tonight. Take that away. Okay, and you can see I have not done this perfectly. Uh, I don't want you here all evening. And again, I'm going to lift those shadows and you can see the greens coming out. You see that? And I'm going to emphasize the clarity and we can see the rock formations coming out also. We still have this problem with this big netting up here, which we have to deal with. Next thing I'm going to do um, is I'm going to take uh, an adjustment brush, a new adjustment brush, reset local corrections, and we're going to make a very, very small brush, and I want to emphasize this curve. And how I'm going to do that is I'm going to paint across here uh, quite quickly, just a thin curve if I can do it. Uh, take off that brush, and I'm just going to lift the shadows slightly. And now we can see that curve coming into play. We can see that curve, we can see more detail. And I'm just also going to nudge the clarity a bit just to show that. And I'm going to nudge those shadows a bit more. So at this point in time, we've done uh, a few things and we've looked at an image that is got all sorts of faults with it. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into the main uh, menu and I'm going to click on saturation. And I know I've got 
this lovely red boy here. So I'm going to just push that red a little. I'm going to click on luminance to just make it stand out. And can you see the oranges and the red standing out on that? It's also standing out in this, but I'm not really interested without those at this point in time. I'm going to go back into the main menu. That's, sorry, it's taken it in. Okay, filter, sorry, I pressed on the wrong button there. Come back, camera raw filter. Come back into camera raw filter. 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 Back into camera raw filter and now what I'm basically going to do is I'm going to look at uh, the effects which look at post crop vignetting and I'm just going to edge it up to the right and if you look in the corners you can see that vignetting disappearing and so are those very dark spots come back to the main menu and you can see that basically that dark corners have basically gone. So after that I'm going to do a bit of pre-sharpening, take to 25, take down to 8, mask the sky, okay, and then I'm going to go okay and it's going to go into Photoshop and there is our image in Photoshop and let's do what I just said about looking at things small. We've still got a little bit of issues on the dark corners. Some people might like it, some people might not. I'm not particularly keen on it. I'm going to come back in there. And what I'm going to do now with the easy brush, the spot healing brush, is I'm going to take that away, and 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 I'm going to leave that one out there. Now, uh, I'm not particularly keen about how the spot brush worked there, so I'm going to take my clone tool, there's my clone tool there, and I'm going to press Alt, click there, and then just cl clone over that piece of water when I'm, sorry, when I'm on the right one, clone, and there we go. If you hold the right key, it does help, Ruth. Okay, um, I can also see a water spot there as well. So that's something else that I'm going to need to look at to do. So I'm going to take my clone tool there and just come over the top of that there. And cloning takes a bit of time to get right, as you can see, to particularly get the tones right. Okay, let's come over there a bit more. There. Now you can see there, I've cloned really badly. So what I'm going to basically do is go back, go back, go back, and look at that cloning again, and take a sample from somewhere else and go over it. And it's still not right. So when you're using cloning, you really have to think, where are you taking the sample from? You know, is the sample, that's a bit better. Okay, so there we are. We've taken it back in uh, to Photoshop. And um, what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to take my lasso tool and I'm going to draw around this lovely rock face come up and off of here. And again, this is done particularly roughly. It would take more to do that. And I'm going to go back to my curves layer and you can see it's all in the dark tones. And instead of just pushing up in those dark tones there. I'm just going to push up from about the center and just raise that slightly. So now we can see the emphasis on the rocks here. Now this is an image that you could work on and work on and work on and work on, particularly with reference to the water and the movement in it. Um, but again, if I make a stamp layer and I go stamp or command E, and then I can go back into filter, uh, camera raw filter, and we can see that we've got a, a quite nice image in the making here with not much work going on. So I'm going to leave it there with those two images tonight. Um, I hope that I have shown you a few things that you might know or you might not know um, and I hope that you will be persuaded to look at a picture in a different way, 
plan what you want to achieve from it. Use the minimum amount of uh, work on the sliders to get to where you want to get and then perfect it within Photoshop. And, and I have said, I have not used uh, all of the many, many things that Photoshop can do, but I wanted to keep it simple for tonight. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope that's been of use to you. Very happy to answer any questions. That's great. Thank you very much, Ruth. We, we do have some questions. Um, some have come in from Facebook. Yeah. And then um, there are also some people obviously on um, Zoom who might like to ask questions as well. So if they want, if anyone on Zoom wants to raise their hand, I can uh, make you um, uh, audible. Um, okay, so let's start with a question from uh, Facebook. Uh, Philly Benito Brook, uh, she you answered one of her questions actually, but part of it was, do you um, bracket your exposures at all? When I shoot in camera, is that what she means? Yeah, when you're shooting in camera. Yeah, I bracket my exposures in really tricky lighting situations. Um, and I do sometimes blend photos together. Um, and, but that's probably the only reason that I bracket. But what I do do is if, for instance, I'm on in a landscape, I'll take something like uh, an f-stop of f11 uh, and then an f-stop of f13 uh, and then maybe I'm not keen on low f-stops. I know people talk about ultimates but for landscapes I think you need f11. f16 is a bit pushing it but it depends. So I, I will do that and if I do bracket exposures then I'll bracket them for a very specific reason and that is usually to combine them as one image and then do work on that in Photoshop. I hope that answers that question. Okay yes yeah, so it's kind of um, minimal HDR high dynamic range. That's right. Yeah okay sort of low key. Um, let me just see uh, oh one question I was when you were doing your masking do you ever use auto mask? Uh, no, never use auto mask um, because I'm always looking at the particular points of the image that I want to mask to achieve what whatever it is I want to achieve, yeah. be it, you know, dark lights, clarity or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, because um, I, I find it sometimes it's quite useful, but you have to really keep an eye on it because it can it can be quite spotty. You know what I mean? You think you've selected a big area, but when you go in, actually, it's it's kind of. Yeah. not selected some areas so yeah. use with caution i would say anyway um sarah williams asked what calibrator do you use for your screen ah well i'm particularly lucky and i think you know this don't you angela the answer to this question be because i have got uh, an iso screen that is self calibrating and no it isn't cheap and i haven't had it forever um but it makes a huge difference before before um, I was lucky enough to have that screen, I used a spider um, to calibrate the screen with, and I used it for years on this um, old Apple cinema screen, and many of the prints, many of the prints that I've had in exhibitions were printed from it, and it worked perfectly well. There are all sorts of calibrators, mm. um, but you need one. Um, yeah. You need to get it right. Yeah, I've got, um, I've got a spider. Yeah. The latest one is the... Oh, that's the I haven't got enough white cable pole. to bring it out, but there, there it yeah. is, uh, and they're they're relatively affordable and, and pretty easy to yeah, use. Yeah, they are. Um, Liz Kenny asked, "How do you uh, I don't, how do you visualize spots in Photoshop?" I think that was a general question, but we just wanted. Sorry, to I didn't hear that. How do you visualize spots in Photoshop? You showed um, how to do. Oh it right, so what I do uh, basically in Photoshop is. Uh, and I couldn't show this tonight because I think it's too difficult to show people, a uh, hundred people or how many of them are there. What I basically did, um, what I basically do in Photoshop is I zoom in to a hundred percent and then I uh, move around the image bit by bit by bit by bit and whatever marks there are, you know, sometimes for instance, uh, where I live near the broads, is if I'm doing something that's a long exposure, I won't see anything on the small um, picture on the screen, and then I'll zoom into 100% or even 200% sometimes, and I'll go, what are all those tiny marks? And it's the piece overhead 
and <laughs> their long exposure little lines. Right. Yeah. And I basically then use the spot two to get rid of them. That's how I basically do that. And it, I still think even if you use uh, the brush like I did in, in, in Camera Raw, it's worth going back over uh, because you're going to print it and it'll show. It'll show yeah. like your thumb. Yeah. I find that camera raw, it, it's okay with kind of little dust specks and yeah. you know relatively simple stuff. But if you've got quite complex yeah. issues, like I was trying to clone out some people who were blurred on a beach and because it was a pebbly beach, it, camera raw just wouldn't do it. But if I went to Photoshop, it took a little while, but using the content aware fill and everything eventually. Yeah. An and I was going to look at content aware fill tonight, but I, it's, a, it's a complex bit of kit and it can work yeah. well or it can work disastrously. <laughs> yes, it's very true. Um, right. Uh, oh, sorry. I thought we'd got a question in Zoom. If anyone would like to ask a question, just, just uh, click on the option to uh, raise your hand or you can ask it in uh, the uh, chat. Just think it's just people saying thank you very much and they've really enjoyed it, found it useful. Um, I noticed you use the adjustment brush quite a bit, which is very useful. Do you ever use the graduated filter tool? Yeah, I again, you know, what I had to work out tonight is I sort of wanted to keep it as simple as I could because I know my audience is, you know, a range of abilities. And I thought the worst thing in the world, I mean, I can remember actually, Angela, years ago, I went to a course and that's for all these people that have been on courses and been left completely standing by what people say. And somebody said to me, I want you to open four pictures all at once and float them on the screen. And I just sat there looking a complete door. And I thought, you know, what is this man talking about? So one of the reasons I didn't use every tool is that I didn't want to confuse people. I just wanted to get across that with relatively little processing, if you've got a good, if you like, negative or digital negative, you can achieve quite a lot and get a good print. But mm -hmm. I do use the graduated filter. Um, but I think the adjustment brush can work just as well. What I do use the radial filter for, a radial filter for sometimes, is to draw little light spots uh, that I might just want to highlight something on brickwork and just nudge up uh, the exposure of that very, very slightly. So you're just emphasizing a particular place. I, I, but you can't do everything. And come on, I did it live, you know. I, it was, it, it yes. was hard. <laughs> I've done it myself and I was at one point I did want to say to everybody it is actually very very hard to keep talking about what you're doing yeah and thinking about the next thing you're going to do and explain yeah. it so you did extremely well thank you for that <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it's it, it is interesting um you know what you were saying about uh the adjustment brush is very useful the graduated filter is very useful there's no right or wrong way is there I mean no. sort of, the, the important thing is to have a process and sort yeah. of like tick all the boxes so you've got rid of all the yeah. um, marks and things like that. But actually, both Photoshop and Camera Raw and Lightroom, you know, you can do the same thing in a variety of different ways or you can get to the end result that you want, which may be different to the end result I want in several different ways. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, like I said, you know, I'm no purist and I don't believe and I would never, ever... Uh, advocate saying it is this way and only this way. I mean, there are certain rules that you know you have to understand things like the histogram. You have to understand that you can't blow highlights. But there are different ways of achieving things, and you do have to work out a way that works for you. But I have to say that you know learning layers and learning curves, particularly, you know, enhanced my processing a great deal, and I couldn't do that much tonight um but if you you know if anybody wants to ask me about those things they're very happy to email me I'm very happy to to answer questions as to what I do that's great thank you very much I mean um I think it was Maggie sorry I think it was Maggie Haig she was asking what the difference is between Lightroom and Adobe Camera Raw because she's never used Camera Raw and what the advantages are now you touched on that at the very beginning Okay. They use exactly the same engine, but when Lightroom first came out, it or you know it'd been around for a little while, it didn't have exactly the same um, 
range of tools did it or it didn't have this you couldn't for example you couldn't adjust the curves in the same way as you can in camera raw it's That's a while right. since i did a conversion sorry a comparison but i think they are much closer now aren't they they are much closer and lightroom also can do all sorts of fancy bits that camera raw now can't and if that's what you want if that's mm. what it's what you know and what you like to be perfectly yeah. honest that, that that's important and um i know that for me all that you know the way the files are stored drives me a bit bonkers in lightroom and so mm. I know that other people love it because they key word, you know, and they, you know, have, it's almost like a huge spreadsheet and they just love spreadsheets. And I go, no, I can't be bothered with all of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just want to find Torridon and I want to, you know, know it was May and find what I need to find and get on and do it. But, you know, it's whatever, whatever works for you, whatever works yeah. for you. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I'm the same as you. I mean, I started out using Photoshop and then and, and Camera Raw as a result. And then when Lightroom came along, I have used it for a long period yeah. of time, but I always feel more comfortable in Camera Raw. That's and, right. you know, they're, same as me. They're just, they're just as valid. And in the coffee morning last Thursday, well, there was quite yeah. a long conversation about Lightroom, which was very interesting. I think everyone learned a lot from uh, chatting with Glennis there, but the general conversation. So, you know, it's, it is, as you say, yeah, she obviously really liked her. it, didn't she? Yeah, she yeah. loves it, you know. So. Yeah. But yeah. then she has a very specific thing. She, you know, she makes cards, doesn't she? And she probably wants to store things in a very particular way, which I think it's very useful for. Yeah. No, I think you're right. Um, I mean, per personally, I don't use Photoshop very much at all. I do right. just about all of the processing I do in um camera raw and right. I, the image i was talking about where i opened it because there was um a trick you know trying to clone out some people blurred people i think that was the first time i've used photoshop in six months for right. something like that you know maybe even longer right uh, so and you know, i use photoshop you know really if you take some of the images that i had tonight i probably would have done some more working curves and they it would have all been about the luminosity and basically uh you know just modifying things like shadows and highlights using the curves layer and when you looked back there'd probably be about 10 or 12 layers but they're all either the minor modifications using that lasso tool looking at something in particular dodging and burning i do use um but again you have to be careful because you're destroying pixels when you use it too. yeah yeah okay well thank you very much there's lots of people commenting to say how much they've enjoyed it how much they've learned and how useful the whole yeah, well i don't know about how much they've learned you know, i think they've learned like you can click on the wrong slider and do it, get it wrong. <laughs> um, and that's absolutely fine. But um, I do hope, I mean, I did think to myself this morning, uh, because Philly Benito Brook was um, showing me how to make the fantastic pizza dough that she makes. And I said, she sent me a little video and I said, I think we should be watching you making the dough rather <laughs> than me making a bit of a fool of myself live and whatever possessed me to do it. So I'm now off to have a nice Harris gin. So thank you very much <laughs> for this evening. Um, you know, my adrenaline level, adrenaline levels are very high and I now need that gin. I think you will need, you deserve a gin. You've done a, okay. you've done a brilliant job. So thank you very much. I, I like a bit of gin myself. I've never tried the Harris gin, but I've only heard good things about oh, well, it. Well, you'll, you'll love the bottle it. as well. Just look it up when I've left. Look up the beautiful bottle that you can then use. Thank you very oh, much, Angela. Yeah. You're very welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, have, have a good bye. evening. Bye.